Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, the Danube Institute, uh, may I welcome you to this event. My name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the uh, president of the Institute. And we uh, like to think that we keep a watch on all of the questions that affect the morality and politics, law um, and regulation. Um, and, and we feel on this occasion that many of these issues are coming to a head in a dramatic way. Uh, about 20 years ago, Michael Kinsley, the editor of the New Republic, the principal left liberal uh, magazine in the United States, um, spent a year in London as a member of the Economist uh, editorial group. Um, when he returned, he wrote an essay on freedom of speech in Britain and in the United States. He said that he had always believed that, uh, that freedom of speech needed uh, constitutional support. Um, which it had in America in the First Amendment. Um, and he still believed that. But his visit to England had caused him to reflect more widely uh, on the concept of um, speech uh, and liberty. Um, and he had returned with the following impression. When he went to the theater, or when he watched television in England, he was struck by, I don't say the extreme, but by the very remarkable degree of freedom of speech, criticism of government, um, debate on moral questions, uh, candor, uh, and all of the other things which we regard as necessary and desirable aspects of liberty in speech. Um, and he came back thinking that in some ways, um, there was a greater atmosphere of freedom in some ways in Britain in the United States, particularly, let us say, in the theater, where he went to the subsidized national theaters to discover the policy and, and general character of the British government that was actually organizing this had come under very considerable attack. In fact, he never saw any defenses of, of the government. Um, and he came back to an America, which he was grateful for the liberty that there was, but he felt it didn't in some respects extend as far as he would like, certainly in, uh, in, a, in social events and other ways. Now, um, as I say, Mr. Kinsley uh, believed in both a culture of liberty uh, and in constitutional protection for liberty. And he thought that they each needed the other uh, in order to have the fullest flowering. Uh, of the virtue. Um, and at the time, I don't think he felt that either was seriously threatened. But of course, it is seriously threatened today in both these countries, as well as many others, because on the one hand, um, the culture of liberty is under attack from a generation which actually regards liberty as an obstacle to achieving greater liberty and justice. Um, they feel that speech which criticizes minority groups or is critical of some of the arrangements for them is, um, is weakening, uh, weakening the, um, the, the, the groups and their social position uh, and, in, and discouraging them from expressing themselves. Well, um, obviously, uh, that is a critique of the culture. And it is perfectly true that that critique is now mounted by, I don't say an entire generation, but by a significant percentage of younger people, and particularly younger people in academic life um, at university and college. Um, at the same time, and I think we should presumably expect the culture to affect the politics of a society. In fact, it's often said that politics is downstream from culture. But the arrival of a generation that is skeptical of um, free speech or sees dangers in it, it's bound to affect their view of the protection that it receives constitutionally in both countries, but particularly in the First Amendment of the United States. And whereas uh, one of my first essays in the Hungarian Review some years ago was to call for 
the uh, uh, European First Amendment, I now uh, find that from the politics, from in the political world, there is very considerable uh, number, there are considerable demands for a restriction of the First Amendment, which would have been, I think, more or less unthinkable, particularly in the center and the left of, British, of American politics some years ago. So there is now a ferment of debate and argument about a, a liberty which we all took for granted recently. That's why I'm so delighted to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Anna Lutfi, who is a, an academic, but also a practicing barrier in the area of employment, human rights, and equality law. She has, uh, she has a record of being involved in these legal debates uh, on freedom of speech, and I'm delighted that she's with us. And I'm going to call on my colleague, Dr. David Martin-Jones, our Director of Research, to take the chair of the meeting, tell you more about her, and I will retreat to the audience, uh, not, not taking uh, <laughs> Dr. Lutfi's uh, lecture as I go. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Well, a lot of what John had said there will be addressed um, in depth and detail by Dr. Lutfi uh, shortly. Uh, I, I met Anna in um, London around 2019 when we both attended a Legatum Institute event to try and um, uh, defend freedom of speech. And uh, we went to a meal afterwards and found we had a lot in common particularly about the idea of um, uh, sin and crime, which you know, we, uh, well, we both talked about uh, at a number of occasions during long uh, lunches uh, when we were both at King's, um, where she was uh, training to be a barrister or coming to the qualification to be a barrister, and I was hanging out in war studies um, Anna subsequently went on to um, have a practice with what, the Clark Room, uh, Clark's Room, where she's practicing as a barrister, has a great record of defending uh, people who've somehow offended speech uh, compellence uh, criteria, like Harry Miller, who she worked with for a long time, and is currently involved in a number of important projects on the nature of belief and uh, how that can interact with understandings of freedom of speech. So I'll hand over to Anna and then we'll have uh, some interaction afterwards. Thank you, David. Köszönöm szépen mindenkinek. Nagyon örülök, hogy itt lehetek. Én itt laktam Budapesten 15 évig, amikor tanítottam a CEUN, a Közép-Európai Egyetemen és uh, majdnem tíz év óta volt, mióta mi, volt itt, itt uh, bocsánat, tehát majdnem tíz év óta voltam itt utoljára, és nagyon örülök, hogy itt vagyok, és ez egy nagyon szép élmény, és köszönöm szépen az intézetnek, hogy meghívott engem. Uh, I just wanted to say something in Hungarian to, um, to, <laughs> to, to honor the uh, country of my training, because whilst I have, as David said, recently trained to become a practicing barrister in equality and human rights law, my real moral training began here in Budapest when I studied history at the Central European University. And it was there that I really felt that I understood some fundamental moral lessons which have informed my legal practice and I hope will continue to inform my legal practice. In particular, uh, the moral uh, imperative of any society to have a serious and ongoing conversation about the limits of speech and the dangers of abandoning that commitment. So if we can start the slides, um, as you can see uh, from my introduction here, I've put myself not only as a barrister, but also director of the Bad Law Project, which is a new project established in London, which has a, um, a commitment to freedom of expression issues, uh, but much more besides. And instead of wasting time now, I would like to move on to my talk. But at the end, if you'd like to ask me some questions about the Bad Law Project and what it is about, 
Um, it was founded by Lawrence Fox, the actor, who you, some of you may have heard of. He comes from a big acting dynasty. And until 2019, he wasn't really a political animal. Uh, but he made some comments on national television uh, about racism in Britain. And that was the end of his career. Uh, and so he became overnight a political animal uh, with, a, with a commitment to uh, freedom of expression as a, an important national debate in the UK. And the Bad Law Project uh, is an offshoot of his political party, which is called the Reclaim Party. And I'm very happy to discuss it in more detail if you want to know more about our projects and what we're trying to achieve through the Bad Law Project and why we're called the Bad Law Project. But for now, let's turn to my talk, which is entitled Evil Effects, Belief, Opinion, Free Speech, The Changing Landscape of Free Expression in UK Law. The beneficial effect of state intervention, especially in the form of legislation, is direct, immediate, and so to speak visible, whilst its evil effect are gradual and indirect and lie out of sight. This is a quote from A.V. Dicey in his 18, 1905 lectures on the relation between law and public opinion. And my title today, Evil Effects, is taken from this quote. Dicey is probably the most famous British constitutional lawyer and jurist and compulsory reading for any serious student of the law, particularly the common law, which, like the United States, forms the basis of the English legal system. And as many of you may be aware, common law derives its system of operations not from legislation, but from custom, and what we call judicial precedent, that is, the decisions of the higher courts shape the decisions of subsequent rulings. Common law has been contrasted, again, as many of you will be aware, with the civil legal systems of continental Europe, which have written constitutions, like the United States, and endless law codes and written commentaries. In those law codes and written commentaries are found rights, endless amounts of rights defined precisely to the letter and limited to the letter. In common law, we don't have codified rights, treaties, commentaries, specifications, codexes, explanatory frameworks. We have a presumption of what John referred to in his introduction, of liberty of what Dicey called, not in the economic sense, but in the legal sense, laissez-faire. And we, in the common law tradition, particularly those of us who are concerned with rights and liberties, we are watching very carefully to see that that presumption of liberty is not encroached upon by the state and its legislative evil effects. We all know the benefits of state legislation, as Dicey pointed out, but the evil effects are gradual and invisible, and they require cautionary attention to prevent state encroachments of the kind that we have seen on this continent in the last 100 years. I argue that in Britain today, the common law system is being displaced by something like the continental civil legal system of rules and regulations, which dictate what rights an individual expects to have and what limits the individual expects to face on his or her rights. And I say that the current direction of travel flies in the face of the laissez-faire presumption at common law that an individual is free unless prescribed by law from an action. For Dicey, the evil effects of abandoning the common law system was a direction of travel that led only to one destination, socialism. But that is not the subject of today's talk. 
but to put, not to put too fine, too fine a point on it, what Dicey was basically concerned about, which many jurists and judges today express similar concerns about, remember Dicey was writing in the late 19th, early 20th century, was the production at industrial levels of legislation, very rarely scrutinized and very rarely debated in Parliament. And that could only lead for Dicey towards greater state control of the individual and the everyday life of the individual. So what I'm going to do is to uh, defend common law, to defend common law in an unashamedly passionate and romantic spirit of sentiment that Rousseau would find nauseating. The common law of England is an unimaginable, unimaginable archive of thought, interpretation, and decision-making. It is contextual. It is fact-specific. And this archive forms the traditional basis of our system, today exported all over the world, particularly to the financial centers, as the model, the template for good law. And that continues to this day. And it is an integral source of Britain's soft power in the world. But back home in the UK, we are seeing particularly in the area of fundamental rights, individual rights, an erosion of the very premise of the common law. And because I specialize in freedom of expression cases, I'm going to focus on one particular right, and that is the presumption of a right to free expression at common law. And I will try to chart the manner in which the common law has been undermined by two pieces of domestic legislation in recent times. One is the Human Rights Act of 1998, and the second is the Equality Act of 2010, uh, which come to us as a legacy of another document, an international human rights document called the European Convention on Human Rights, which I sometimes refer to as the convention. By the way, I sometimes use free speech interchangeably with freedom of expression. You'll hear both phrases. They're not technically the same, but I, I don't want to go there today. Now, my thesis is threefold. I will argue that the Equality Act of 2010, which I come to later, dispenses with the concept of rights altogether. It's a radical proposition, I grant you. And it replaces rights with protections. And the protection I'm going to look at today is protected belief, which is a cornerstone of protections found in the UK Equality Act. I argue that protected belief is replacing the fundamental right to freedom of expression, particularly because it does not include opinions. Thoughts and opinions are not technically beliefs, and therefore they are not subject to uh, lawful protection under equality law. And this, I say, has evil effects. The rise of the notion of protected belief and the decline of the idea that we have a common law right to speech has resulted in the elevation of a religious template for legitimate speech, and increasing sanctions for those who hold mere opinions, and ultimately the erosion of the notion of a common law right to free expression altogether. The common law right to freedom of expression is discussed by Dicey in another uh, work of his authored in 1885, The Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution, in which Dicey discusses the attitude in England to what he calls freedom of thought and the fight for the free expression of opinion. Dicey takes pains to distinguish English law from the French jurisprudence, which was forged, as many of you will know, in the wake of a violent and bloody revolution in 1789. The publication of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in 1789 and the subsequently drafted French Constitution of 1791. In those documents, freedom 
of discussion and liberty of the press were proclaimed with revolutionary passion in the French language. But Dicey writes, at no time has there in England been any proclamation of the right to liberty of thought or freedom of speech. He illustrates this point with reference to the English law of libel. He writes, again, in the late 19th century, our present law permits anyone to say, write, and publish what he pleases, but if he make bad use of this liberty, he must be punished. He says in respect of blasphemy, it will surprise most persons to learn that on one view of the law, anyone who publishes a denial of the truth of Christianity in general or the existence of God, whether the terms of such publication are decent or otherwise, commits the misdemeanor of publishing a blasphemous libel and is subject liable to imprisonment. Dicey then repeats his claim that phrases like freedom of discussion or liberty of the press, which were proclaimed in France as one of the most valuable rights of man, are rarely found in English law. I'm sorry about the um, wonky slide. You, are, you can't read the text, but let me read the quote for you. Um, he says, such rights, such as liberty of the press and freedom of thought, are rarely found in any part of the statute book, nor among the maxims of the English common law. As terms of art, they are quite unknown to our courts. At no time has there in England been any proclamation of the right to liberty of thought or to freedom of speech. So how is it then that in England, Individual liberty, including freedom of expression and the press, has been traditionally considered an integral principle upon which English legal life is founded and public institutional life is founded. Dicey poses this million dollar question and then proceeds to answer it. He cites the English judge Edward Law, Lord Ellenborough, who says the law of England is a law of liberty and consistent with this liberty, we have not what is called an imprimatur, license, permission. There is no such license necessary. But if a man publish a paper, he is exposed to the penal consequences as he is in every act, if it be illegal. This cannot be overestimated in terms of its importance. Dicey's argument is that we do not need specific rights that we extrapolate from the common law because we don't need them. As a general principle, Rights and freedoms are established by default at common law on the basis that no man is punishable but for a breach of the law. In other words, as I said earlier, common law works on the presumption of liberty or, as Dicey would put it, laissez-faire. Lawyers and judges will mark limitations to rights on the basis of interpretations of statute and other legal sources and on the facts of a case. But where no limitation can be read, common law will prevail in spite of the fact that no specific common law right has been proclaimed or defined or codified. Now that situation that I have described, albeit in fairly simplistic terms, was the consensus that formed the basis of the English legal system until something called the Human Rights Act 1998 came into force in October of 2000. Very recent history we are talking about. And this act installed what I would call a human rights regime 
in the UK in codified form by giving effect to rights and freedoms that are guaranteed under the European Convention on Human Rights. That convention came into effect in 1953. All Council of Mem Europe member states, including the 27 European Union countries, are signatories. And the UK was the first nation to ratify the convention in 1951. But it wasn't until 1998 that the rights guaranteed by the European Convention could be enforced in UK courts against all public bodies or any private body that discharged a public function. That's a difficult distinction in law, but we won't talk about that now. Basically, it gave the uh, domestic power to bring cases on the basis of the Convention against public bodies in the UK courts. Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights proclaims the right to free speech. And it's composed of two paragraphs, positive right followed by a negative qualification. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression. I'm so sorry, this is all a bit messy. You must just listen to me and ignore the slides. Um, it hasn't condensed the text, but let me read you the first part of paragraph one of article 10. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression, followed by, this right shall include freedom to hold opinions. The second paragraph says the exercise of this freedom, since it carries with it duties and responsibilities, may be subject to such formalities conditions, restrictions, or penalties as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society. So there are two things to note here. That the first paragraph of Article 10 guarantees the individual the right to hold opinions as part of a general right to freedom of expression. I will come back to opinions. The second paragraph of Article 10 places restrictions on that right transforming it into what we call a qualified right, i.e. that which can be limited in the interests of national security, the protection of health and safety, uh, the securing of public morality, and to preserve democratic society. And this can be construed in all manner of ways, as we shall see. Article 9 of the European Convention gives everybody the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And it also gives the individual the right to manifest their religion or belief. So that's an important thing to note right there, that the right to hold a religion or a belief is distinct. <laughs> this becomes amusing, believe me. Is distinct from the right to manifest that religion or belief. And like Article 10, paragraph two of Article 9 says, freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs shall be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society, in the interests of public safety or for the protection of public order, for health, morals, protection of the rights and freedoms of others. So, we have the right to freedom of religion and belief, the right to manifest that belief, and the qualification that that right can be limited where necessary in a democratic society, which is a very general clause and allows democracy, the word, to do a lot of heavy lifting, as we shall see. The export of convention rights, Article 9 and 10 particularly, into UK domestic law via the Human Rights Act may be characterized as the proclamation, revolutionary French style in the UK, of inalienable rights and liberties that the French had enjoyed since 1789. And that has to be a good thing, right? There's no common law fluff, no boring cases, volumes of twittering judges going on about all sorts of rubbish. It's there in black and white. That's a good thing, no? Well, for some judges in the 90s, there was a concern as the uh, passing of the UK Human Rights Act 
seemed imminent, that Article 10, which guarantees freedom of expression, it's not really necessary in England. English judges in the 1990s tended to characterize Article 10 as surplus to requirements. Why would you need Article 10 to proclaim a right that already exists at common law by default? In the case of Derbyshire and Times Newspapers Limited in 1993, the House of Lords held that local authorities would not be permitted to sue in libel as it would be a disproportionate interference with free expression. And Lord Keith of the House of Lords made clear that Article 10 was not required. He stated that the common law of England, is that there? Or have I missed one? Yes, the common law of England, apologies. The common law of England is consistent with the obligations assumed by the crown under the treaty in this particular field. You can't read it, I'm really sorry. But basically what Lord Keith was saying is what I just said. Why have Article 10 if you've got common law freedom of speech? And at the same time as this case was heard, other judges started to emphasize the importance of something called the principle of legality. The principle of legality basically states that Parliament cannot restrict rights at common law, and this is really important, unless it does so through very clear express language. From a free speech perspective, what the principle of legality means is that there is a presumption of right to speech at common law that cannot be overridden by legislation, unless it does so precisely and clearly, and the person can know or have a reasonable expectation of where that right is limited. And that principle of legality was deployed by judges in a robust defense of common law freedom of expression, again, without any need for a European convention and without any need for Article 10, in Crown and Secretary of State for the Home Department ex parte Sims, in which Lord Hoffman confirmed that the common law could defend free speech without a code. Lord Hoffman stated, parliamentary sovereignty, is it there? Don't know if it's there, no. We'll go back, sorry. Oops. Lord Hoffman stated in Secretary of State for the Home Department ex parte Sims, that parliamentary sovereignty means that parliament can, if it chooses, legislate contrary to fundamental rights. And the Human Rights Act will not detract from this power, but the principle of legality means that parliament must squarely confront what it's doing and accept the political cost. Fundamental rights, said Lord Hoffman, cannot be overridden by general or ambiguous words. And I remind you here of the qualifications that we read in Articles 9 and 10 of the European Convention. Limitations necessary in a democratic society with public health and morals and where it might be, you know. You know. Th these are general and ambiguous words. They are not precise limitations. And the importing of such general and ambiguous words into UK domestic legislation is a fundamental degradation of the common law presumption of the principle of legality. Okay, I've described some judicial voices in the 90s that were resistant to the need for a codified right to freedom of expression. But we also see in the same period, some judicial voices who were increasingly embracing the Convention on Human Rights and Article 10 in particular, the right to freedom of expression, at the expense of the common law. In other words, we also see in the 90s, in addition to a defense of the common law and the defense of the use of the principle of legality, we also see some judicial voices denigrating common law and saying that you know, it has less value than it had and that is right. 
In the uh, case of Attorney General and Guardian newspapers, this was part of a very famous uh, series of litigation cases known as the spy catcher litigation. Um, it was suggested that free speech uh, was a merely residual liberty under common law. Lord Gough made clear in this case that any right at common law to freedom of speech was basically covered by Article 10. And he said, I see no inconsistency between English law and Article 10 of the European Convention. The exercise of the right to freedom of expression under Article 10 may be subject to restrictions as are prescribed by law and necessary in a democratic society, but I have no reason to believe that English law as applied in the courts would lead to any different conclusion. In his article entitled, Is There a Common Law Right to Freedom of Speech? The Australian legal scholar, Dan Meager, describes this shift away from common law and towards codified human rights regimes as a doctrinal shift. That, ref that reflects a profound transformation in the very paradigm that underpins the English legal system. Meager writes, contemporary development, sorry, I'm so sorry about this. Oh, you'll just have to listen, I'm oh, sorry. Meager wrote, contemporary developments throughout the common law world which have put pressure on the common law's residual conception of freedom of speech. Yes, yeah, sorry. Contemporary developments throughout the common law world have put pressure on the common law's residual conception of freedom of speech. Again, Meager is echoing the language of Lord Goff. Common law is residual. That means it persists in spite of a more powerful trend towards a codified system of rights. And what I'm saying is that that doctrinal shift represents a complete reversal of the common law principle of laissez-faire. No man is punishable except for a distinct breach of the law. In order to understand this shift away from common law from the 2000s onwards, and the dramatic implications for free speech that have been brought about by another piece of legislation that I'm going to talk about, the UK Equality Act of 2010. We need to explore the concept of equality as it appears in the international human rights regime documents that led to the passing of the UK Equality Act. It's very important that equality at common law doesn't really have a significant meaning above and beyond the fact that everybody is entitled to access legal representation and to make representations at law. That is where equality rests at common law. But under international human rights regimes of codified human rights, we see equality becomes a right. If we look at Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Article 7, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. Notice that with equality, we also get the words discrimination and protection. And if we look at Article 26, sorry, is it there at the bottom? Article 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights from 1966, all people are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. Discrimination and protection. The UK is party to both of these documents, but they're not binding legally, unlike the European Convention on Human Rights. But the wording and the sentiment of these international treaties seep into the European Convention, Article 14 of which prohibits discrimination and says the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in this uh, convention shall be secured without discrimination on any ground 
such as race, sex, color, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, association with a national minority, property, birth, or other status. So we have a series of positive rights in the European Convention, such as the right to freedom of thought, the right to freedom of expression, but they have to be balanced against this negative right not to be discriminated against. So discrimination, as we saw in Article 7 of the Universal Declaration, is synonymous in human rights doctrine with equality, uh, sorry, with inequality. Inequality is discrimination. One is equal before the law in the sense that one is protected from being discriminated against. This is not a common law construction of equality. It is a formulation that belongs exclusively to the international human rights regime that I have described as growing with industrial strength legislatively through the second half of the 20th century. And this is the formula that I would like you to take away. Lack of protection from discrimination equals inequality. Equality equals protection from discrimination. And equality is a right. Common law rights, in this formulation, evaporate. So the true meaning of equality under the Human Rights Convention regime is protection from discrimination. And if you look at Article 14, which I showed you, but I have another slide, hopefully it will be easier for you to see. Article 14, to go back, says, the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in this convention shall be secured without discrimination on any grounds, boom, such as. And there you have your list. This is the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 14. And they've listed very helpfully the grounds that they suggest um, make it unlawful to discriminate against an individual on the basis of these characteristics as they have come to be known. Sex, race, color, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, association with a national minority property birth or other status. You notice number six, political or other opinion is the basis on which you cannot discriminate unlawfully against somebody in the European Convention on Human Rights. But now we turn to the UK Equality Act of 2010. The UK Equality Act of 2010 codified this article. But it had its own protected characteristics. This is what we call grounds on which it is unlawful to discriminate. Protected characteristics. Section 4 of the UK Equality Act 2010 lists protected characteristics on which grounds you cannot, you cannot lawfully discriminate against a person. Before we come to Section 4, let me just say a little bit about the Equality Act when it came into force. It was passed in October 2010, and it became part of the laws of England, Wales, and Scotland. And the reason that it was passed was because a government review on discrimination had been set up in 2005 to review discrimination and anti-discrimination laws and decided that the landscape in England was way too messy. Um, and there were concerns about the number of laws uh, that were drafted on anti-discrimination grounds, particularly in relation to racial and sex discrimination. So what the Equality Act did was it took over 100 pieces of legislation and brought them into a single act. And if you read the explanatory notes to the Equality Act, because we have explanatory notes, which are very unexplanatory, I may add, the explanatory notes to the Act say that the primary purposes of the Equality Act are to harmonize discrimination law, to support progress on equality, and to this end, there are nine protected characteristics on grounds, which grounds it is unlawful for either a public authority or a private uh, business, service provider, or employer to discriminate against a person. And here we have them. Age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, 
religion or belief, sex, and sexual orientation. We could talk for hours about all of these protected characteristics. There are lots of debates about each one of them. But I'm not interested in anyone but the one highlighted in bold, religion or belief. The more observant among you will have uh, recalled that Article 9 of the European Convention enshrines the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Article 9 says everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to manifest his or her religion or belief. So we could see the protected characteristic of religion or belief as an installation into UK equality legislation of Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights, meaning that under UK equality law, you cannot discriminate against a person because they hold a protected religion or a protected belief. But the really observant amongst you will also recall that under Article 10 of the Convention, the freedom of expression right includes protection of opinions, including political opinions. But you will notice that political opinion, or indeed opinion of any kind, is not present in the list of protected characteristics under the Equality Act. Only, religious, uh, only religion and belief. And the Equality Act helpfully explains uh, religion, uh, religious belief as any religious belief. Uh, and for those of you who are not religious, you have protected philosophical beliefs. And that includes any philosophical belief. It's really helpful, isn't it, the explanation? Um, and that includes lack of belief. And for those of you really confused, you just go to section 10 of the Equality Act, and it says belief means any religious or philosophical belief, including a lack of belief. Um, for example, the Baha'i faith, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Jainism, Judaism, Rastafarianism, Sikhism, and Zoroastrianism are religions for the purposes of this provision. So helpful. But that's religious belief. So then, of course, the question is, well, what, what, what's a philosophical belief? Well, the explanatory notes are, are brilliant. Um, I think I have it. Let's see. <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. These slides are an absolute joke. Never mind. What is a philosophical belief? The explanatory notes to the Equality Act state that beliefs such as humanism and atheism are beliefs for the purposes of this provision, but not adherence to a particular football team. Okay? So that's philosophical belief. A brief glance at the history of the legal category of belief shows us that in the Employment, Equality, Religion, or Belief Regulations of 2003, a philosophical belief was described as similar to a religious belief. But this troubled some of um, the drafters and legislators who were working on the anti-discrimination laws of the time and indeed on the Equality Bill. And in her 2008 report, Religious Freedom, Religious Discrimination, and the Workplace, Lucy Vickers suggested that to be defined as similar to religion was offensive to atheists and humanists. So they dropped the word similar by amendment uh, in 2006 to the Equality Bill. But the problem remained. What is a philosophical belief? In 2005, Baroness Scotland, who was then the Attorney General, commented on the Equality Bill as it was then passing through the UK Parliament Philosophical beliefs must always be of a similar nature to religious beliefs. But it will be for the courts to decide what constitutes a belief. But case law shows us that a philosophical belief must attain a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion, and importance, and it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, and it must not be incompatible with human dignity. Therefore therefore doing a lot of heavy lifting here, an example of a belief that might meet this description is humanism. But something that would not would be support of a political party, for example. That's the Attorney General, Baroness Scotland, 2005. 
Whether it's expressly stated in legislation that a philosophical belief is similar to religion or is not similar to religion, it is clear from Baroness Scotland's comments that philosophical beliefs must somehow be similar to religious belief in order to qualify as having this, this cohesion and importance and seriousness that makes it more than or not just an opinion. To be protected, a philosophical belief has to be important to the believer, such that the belief structures the individual's every waking moment and his lifestyle choices. Like a Muslim rising to prayer and going to bed to prayer, so the philosophical belief will structure the believer's life. And so while Article 10 of the European Convention, Freedom of Expression, and Article 14, prevent prohibition on discrimination, do include protection for opinion, including political opinion, under UK equality legislation from the 2000s, protected thought and speech for which one may not be discriminated against extends only to beliefs that are by definition not opinions and not political opinions. A key case on protected belief is at the top there, McClintock and the Department of Constitutional Affairs, 2008, in which the judge, Elias P, held that to constitute a belief, there must be a religious or philosophical viewpoint in which one actually believes. It is not enough to have an opinion based on some real or perceived logic or based on information or lack of information. And in the key case on protected belief that was heard at the Employment Appeal Tribunal in 2010, that is a very important case, Granger and Nicholson, uh, the claimant who was appealing the decision at first instance was saying that he had been discriminated on the grounds of his belief that carbon emissions should be cut to avoid catastrophic climate change. And it was submitted in the tribunal that the claimant's protected belief had to demonstrate that it was part of a system of beliefs, wasn't a political belief, and must not be a scientific belief based on conclusions drawn from scientific research or the gathering of information. And the employment judge in Granger at the first instance and also at the appeal stage repeatedly refer to mere opinion, which they contrast with belief proper. So what we are seeing here in the case of Granger is the construction of protected belief as distinct from unprotected opinion. And this goes to the crux of my argument, which is that the introduction of um, a human rights regime in the United Kingdom through the vehicle of equality and anti-discrimination legislation is slowly dismantling the common law presumption of a right to speech, including opinions, or opinions which Lord Justice Sedley famously stated include irritating opinions, contentious opinions, eccentric opinions, heretical opinions, unwelcome opinions, and provocative opinions. What is really significant about the case of Granger is that in the final appeal judgment, the judge set down the final test for what is a protected philosophical belief. And that test is the go-to test for employment lawyers today. That is where we go if we want to argue that a belief is protected uh, under equality law. And this test is called the Granger criteria. There are five criterion under the Granger criteria to establish whether a belief should be protected at law. The belief must be genuinely held, so you can't pretend to have a belief, okay? It must be a belief and not an opinion or a viewpoint based on the present state of information. It must be a belief as to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behavior. That's Baroness Scotland again. It must attain a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion, and importance. It must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, not be incompatible with human dignity, and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. My main argument today, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is a phenomenally high standard 
to protect speech. Let's have a look at some examples of protected beliefs which have succeeded in meeting the bar. In Olivier and Department of Work and Pensions, it was found or held that a belief in democratic socialism was protected. Now, all, all of you are going to be saying, hang on a minute, I thought you said political beliefs were not protected. Well, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that when you look at the judgment in Olivia, it wasn't his support for the Labour Party that was protected. It was his belief in the core values of the Labour Party, democratic socialism, and that, that qualified as a philosophical belief. Well, you can imagine that now we're all in a quandary in UK equality law in this area because we don't really know what is political belief versus not political or what's how, how if if a belief in democratic socialism as expressed by the core values of the Labour Party is not technically political belief then you know it opens a series of debates which we are having in the United Kingdom as I speak belief in the sanctity of life was protected in Hashman and Milton Park, that was basically a case where the claimant had a belief against the hunting of animals, fox hunting. So his belief in the sanctity of life was held to be, to be protected. Belief in the higher purpose of public service broadcasting, I quite like that one. Belief in ethical veganism, that's uh, Casamitiana Costa and League Against Cruel Sports. Ethical veganism was protected as a philosophical belief. However, in Conisby and Crossley Farms, a belief in vegetarianism did not qualify. Do you see the problem? It is patently obvious from this absolutely random list of protected beliefs that the whole bloody thing is arbitrary. And you just hope that you get a judge on the day that kind of sees your point, right? Unprotected opinions, i.e. beliefs that are not properly beliefs enough to qualify using the Granger criteria, are here. We have uh, McClintock and the Department of Constitutional Affairs. Uh, the claimant's objection to adoption of children by same-sex couples was not a protected philosophical belief because it was an opinion. Supporting a football club McClung and Dusen Babcock Limited was not a protected philosophical belief. But in Makarath and the Department of Work and Pensions, the belief that was claimed needed protecting was the belief that you cannot change your sex. Makarath, the claimant, was a Christian doctor who said that he believed on religious grounds that a person cannot change their sex and he refused to use female pronouns for what he perceived to be a natal male patient who had been suspended, and then, sorry, and then he was suspended and then dismissed from his practice. He said that his belief was derived from the supremacy of Genesis 1.27 and a lack of belief in transgenderism. He said he had no belief that you can identify as or become the opposite sex. Now, this is where it gets fun. Remember I told you that in Article 9, the right to hold a belief is not the same as manifesting a belief. You'll probably think, well, hang on a minute. If this guy was a Christian and he's quoting Genesis to the employment tribunal, how could that not be a protected belief? I mean, I, I read it to you, you know, uh, the list of religions. I think Christianity was there. Yes, Baha'i faith, Zoroastrian and Buddhism, Christianity, there it is. So... So if it was a Christian quoting Genesis, how could that not automatically qualify? Because the employment tribunal said that whilst he was perfectly entitled to hold a Christian religious worldview and a philosophical lack of belief in transgenderism, he was not entitled to manifest his beliefs at work in the way that he did. By refusing to use his patient's correct pronouns, he was manifesting behavior that if anybody had manifested that same behavior, whether Christian or not, they would have been treated in the same way. And therefore, he hadn't been discriminated against on the basis of his Christian beliefs. So, um, 
The law will protect philosophical belief, but not necessarily, because if you manifest it in the wrong way, because you contravene part of a workplace normative culture, then the right to hold belief is, uh, is, is secondary to uh, your um, um, uh, uh, non-right to, to manifest incorrectly those beliefs. <clears throat> this has led to an outcome in the workplace whereby the common law right to hold or manifest an opinion or to speak, where that speech falls below the threshold for protection, it will fail to be protected. And that threshold, as we've seen with the Granger criteria, is very high. Speech is not protected if it's mere opinion. Speech is not protected if it is a belief that's protected but incorrectly manifested. All right, so um, there we are. That's, that's, that's what the case law shows us in terms of the impact of the Equality Act on, um, on judicial decision-making. Uh, now, hang on one second. Yes, so to stay with this transgender issue, now I don't really want to talk about transgenderism as an issue or a debate, but the cases that have come to the case law to test this principle of philosophical belief have, for some reason, revolved around this issue of whether you can change your sex. And you may have heard of the case of Maya Forstarter. In the case of Forstarter and CGD Europe, uh, very simple facts. Uh, she um, claimed that she had been uh, dismissed because she tweeted uh, to the effect that biological sex is real, important, and immutable. It can't be changed. That, she said, was her belief. Uh, and she was dismissed, her contract was not renewed, and she brought it to the employment tribunal. And the judge said that he did not accept that this belief was protected because it was absolutist. Like Makareth, she was asked, would her belief mean that she would refuse to use the correct pronouns for somebody who identified as transgender? And she said she would use the pronouns that she thought right on the basis of her belief. And that meant, said the judge, that she, by virtue of her belief, would refer to a person by the sex that she considers appropriate, even if it violates that individual's dignity and creates an intimidating, hostile, and degrading or offensive environment for that person. What you should know is that under section 26 of the Equality Act, creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, or offensive environment for somebody is harassment. And you cannot harass someone on the basis of gender reassignment. So what the judge was saying was, your belief, which requires you to use the pronouns you want to use, will, if I protect it at law, it means I'm basically sanctioning your right to harass somebody on the basis of their gender identity. So I would be upholding unlawful behavior by granting you protection for your belief. And so his conclusion was, and it became very big news in the UK, that Maya Fallstarter's belief was, remember, the fifth criterion of the Granger criteria, not worthy of respect in a democratic society. It failed the test in Granger and therefore was not protected. This created an absolute shockwave uh, across the country, and so Maya Forstarter appealed. And I'm going to speed up now because I'm aware of time, but on appeal, the judge in Forstarter reversed the decision and said that he considered Maya Forstarter's belief to be worthy of respect uh, in a democratic society. Why? Because it's not Nazism. That was his argument. He said, the only, right that are, the only speech that's not worthy of respect in a democratic society is actual Nazism or totalitarian seizure of power or terrorist attacks on central infrastructure. And since Maya Forstarter's view that biological sex is real important and immutable could not be considered 
equivalent to Nazism, fascism, terrorism, and such extremes, then it was worthy of respect in a democratic society. He said her, her views, her beliefs may be shocking, but they can still be protected and they are worthy of respect. And he said, lots of people think like she does. And one has to be very careful about taking a belief that is widely held by the majority of the population and saying that that view is not worthy of respect in a democratic society. In fact, the quote, exact quote is, um, let's see. You can see with some relief that I'm getting to my conclusion. Um, yeah, you can't read it. But he said, a widely shared belief demands particular care before it can be condemned as being not worthy of respect in a democratic society. So what I want to do now is just say a little bit about what I think the lessons we can take from Maya Forstarter, and then I'll just quickly summarize my general conclusions about the evil effects of these kinds of uh, legislative approaches, which are, if you don't mind the expression, infecting our judicial uh, culture. Um, the, the key issue in Forced Data for me is that because of the Equality Act excluding opinion, mere opinion, from the protected characteristics, and particularly certain kinds of political opinions, we now have a religious criteria for self-expression, which has come in by the back door and is marginalizing other forms of expression, scientific debate, academic debate, artistic creation and expression, and commonly held views, consensus views. These are all being marginalized, and what is being heralded as protected at law is this very high threshold of religious belief or philosophical belief, which is like religious belief a bit. We don't quite know how it works, but I guess we'll know on the day. Um, so, so in Maya Forstarter's case, her view that sex is um, biological and, and, and real and important and can't be changed, she had to go through this circus of showing that what she thought was a belief, like she lives by it, she prays by it, she dreams about it. You know, she can't book a holiday without, you know, screaming to the cabin crew on the aeroplane about it. You know, she, it, it informs every aspect of her waking mind. It's an absurd, absurd criteria for assessing whether speech should be protected at law. And the second problem I have, even though I agreed with the appeal judge when he found that her belief was worthy of respect in a democratic society, was that his argument was, well, she's not a Nazi. <laughs> so what does that do? I tell you what that does, and if you read the UK press, you will know, or social media, you will know, that that just encourages people to say, well, yes, yeah, she is actually. She is a Nazi. And the opposing counsel in the case of Maya Forstarter their argument was people like her with these views are resulting in the literal genocide of individuals who are transgender. She's a Nazi. This is happening in every issue that is central to political life in Britain. If you have questions about the wisdom of an open door policy on immigration or any concerns or questions about the arrangements that are being made for the large numbers of people that are coming in daily, you're a Nazi. You voted to leave the European Union, you're a Nazi. Um, you don't think that zero carbon policies are the best way forward, you're a Nazi. You are actually literally advocating the entire destruction of the human race and the globe. Doesn't get more serious than that, really. So you have a political culture where Nazi and fascist and totalitarian and far-right, racial, white supremacist extremists are bandied about, right, left, and center, uh, to label people who have fairly moderate views or questions or concerns in a pluralistic, democratic polity, they then have to defend themselves as having a protected belief, and the only way they're going to be able to do that to pass the fifth stage of the Granger criteria is to show that they're not a Nazi as well as having this incredibly important, serious, cogent, protected belief. I, I cannot tell you how much this is an assault on that laissez-faire principle with which I began. 
the presumption of liberty to speech unless prohibited by law. So to conclude, I don't know if you can see it, but there we go. Let's see. Yes, thank God. The, the final slide you can actually see. That's good. Um, two conclusions then. One, codified rights systems are encroaching upon the traditional realm of common law rights. The human rights regime that we have inherited from the European Convention proclaims free speech, proclaims freedom of conscience, proclaims freedom of religion, and proclaims freedom of expression and thought. But there is no presumption of any such freedoms any longer, and that is clear from the impact, the devastating impact that UK equality law is having which has abolished the common law right to artistic expression, the right to an opinion, the right to change your mind, the right to have a working hypothesis that you haven't finished working out yet, to go back and forth with people, hone your views. Instead, under the equality regime, the equality rubric that we've inherited from human rights regimes internationally, we have to defend every word. We have to fight for the right to say anything using this absurd quasi-religious criteria, which elevates fanaticism and devotion to an abstract deity as the model for what constitutes legitimate speech, and the sanctions that are poured upon people for not being able to demonstrate that very high burden of proof in a civil legal system where it's supposed to be on the balance of probabilities. The sanctions include loss of jobs, loss of income, loss of livelihood, loss of public reputation, like the actor Lawrence Fox. You know what he did? He rolled his eyes on television. He rolled his eyes when the wrong person, when he shouldn't have rolled his eyes and he lost his career. These sanctions are real for expressing an opinion. It's shocking, really. Uh, and obviously also shocking that one of the other sanctions is the social sanction of being called a Nazi. You're called a white supremacist. You're called a, a, a fascist. You're, you're, you're called, you know, all manner of heinous things because you have a question about something that you think deserves questioning. We have a case at the moment in the UK which I'm involved with. I won't talk about it in detail because it's ongoing. Um, it's a woman who used social media and she tweeted comments that was perceived to be critical of Islam and were judged Islamophobic by her employer. She was dismissed from her job. Okay, get this. She's claiming discrimination on the basis of a protected philosophical belief in freedom of expression. Couldn't make it up. So instead of having a common law right to freedom of speech, she has to show, using the Granger criteria, that she lives, dies, and breathes for freedom of expression. That is her belief, and that is how she's going to defend her claim. We have to see what happens there. It's an interesting case. The second conclusion is that judges, as we saw in the late 90s, are increasingly reluctant to fall back on the common law as a source of fundamental, natural, or inalienable rights. There is a case at the moment, uh, a judicial review, for those of you who don't know, is when you take uh, a public body to court for a decision that you think is unlawful. And some parents in Wales are taking the Welsh government to court because they say that children as young as three are being taught what they consider sexually inappropriate materials. They want to be able to withdraw their children from those lessons which are taught within the framework of sex and relationship education. In England, the Department of Education has recognized that there is a parental right to withdraw from sex education, but the Welsh government has decided that that doesn't exist in Wales. So they are taking the Welsh government to court. We've just received the first judgment, they will appeal. And I read it recently. And the judge said in that judicial review, there is no parental right to withdraw your child because the Welsh government has said so. And when counsel for the claimant brought hundreds of years of case authorities 
that go back to, well, at least the 1820s, talking about the very enshrined relationship of custodial care and wardship that parents have traditionally had over their children, she threw it all out. And she said, yeah, but you know, those cases are not about the parental right to withdraw your child from sex education. The common law presumption of a parental right was irrelevant. It was what the Welsh government had decided that mattered. It's quite shocking judgment. So freedom of expression, ladies and gentlemen, can no longer be presumed as a right at common law. In, under common law, rights and freedoms are seeded and they grow through cases. But what we see now is a residual liberty called common law right, which exists somewhat like pandas in a zoo. It's exotic. Remember that, common law? <laughs> You've got an animal in captivity whose fur is beginning to shed. The light is dimming from its eyes. It's lost its appetite. And, ladies and gentlemen, it can no longer reproduce itself. That is the common law today in the UK. In order to justify your speech, you, the speaker, have to convert yourself into a believer. You then have to discharge the burden of proof that you actually hold that belief. And you have to meet all five of the Granger criteria. In this brave new reality, any right to engage in speech distinct from the category of philosophical belief evaporates, along with common law rights in general and centuries of case law. These are the evil effects of the human rights regime as the specter of equality stalks the continent of Europe and casts the common law world in its shadow. And yet, human rights, anti-discrimination, equality, protection, they sound so harmless. I'm reminded of a line from the novel Az Aytul by Sabo Magda. Isten általában nem figyel ránk, ha kérünk valamit, de megadta azt, amitől félünk. God usually ignored us when we asked for something, but he invariably granted what we feared. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that was uh, very impressive, actually, and uh, very passionate. Um, so, uh, you end, we're, we're finished. There's, so there's nothing, you know, how is it that common lawyers gave up on common law? If you go back to the history of common law, if you go back to the great struggles of common law, particularly in the 16th and 17th century, when um, you know, the struggle for sovereignty was a struggle for the rule of law in parliament as the highest court of law in the country. That there was um, you know, lawyers like uh, Cook or Hale, you know, the, the uh, Selden, um, were committed to, to a view of law that saw a tradition that went back to um, the ancient constitution. And even in the you know, 1970s, you'd get uh, common lawyers like Lord Denning or you know, Wolfton and the Wolfton Report, who made sure that you understood that your law was coming not from something uh, rationalist that was current opinion or current belief, but went back to case law that always was a precedent. And yet it seems now that all that has been thrown away. It does seem that way. Yeah. Well, is there, are there any lawyer, apart from yourself, you know, is there anything? Jonathan Sumption, the former um, um, law lord in the Supreme Court, uh, has expressed concern about what he calls the empire of law, which is law for law's sake. And we have, uh, and this is something that former chief justices have also expressed concern about, some of them seated in the House of Lords today. 
that we have so much legislation being produced. Uh, it, 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 as I used the, the phrase industrial production of legislation, uh, none of which is possibly able to be scrutinized and debated um, to the extent that it ought to be so that the wording of legislation can be um, adequately clear and unambiguous to guarantee a proper common law interpretation that is commensurate with inalienable or fundamental right. Um, and this is also not helped by the existence of a third sector um, in the UK, uh, which are these training bodies, uh, which are you know, training employees and training public officials. They train the police, they train judges, they train civil servants, uh, they train teachers and university professors. Um, they train ordinary employees in companies. Uh, usually through the framework of HR department. And they train people to think in policy terms. Um, and very rarely do they have legal sources in mind at all. And policies are determined by um, political fashion, whim, um, electoral attempts to grab votes, to grab the youth vote. Um, and what we're seeing increasingly is a world dominated by arbitrary policies that are delivered through these third sector organizations which are wholly unaccountable. Nobody elects them, nobody knows who they are or what gives them the, uh, the right to, uh, to determine what is um, you know, proper equality and proper anti-discrimination. They very rarely go to the law or the case law. They just have fashionable political positions. And so what we're seeing, and I think social media doesn't help, um, is a kind of political culture that's driven by virtue, um, uh, and virtue is reflected in policies that have that kind of immediate clickbait effect of, of you know, seeming to be doing all the right things at the right time for the right reasons, but the law's not actually that relevant. We've seen this a lot with policing in the UK, that the police are you know, not really knowing or trained in actual criminal law, they don't know very often when they make arrests which offence they're charging the person with, uh, but very often if it's something to do with regulation of speech, it will just be offence. Offence has been caused, you've been reported, we need to talk to you on a public order offence or malicious communications or something, without having a clue which section of which, uh, you know, criminal offence they're quoting. So it, for me, the problem is that actually society has become more and more disentangled from the law itself. And we live in a, in a media culture that is driven by political whim and law is actually relevant. Uh, people don't read anymore. So who's going to read through all of those volumes and volumes and volumes of case histories, uh, you know, especially when there's so much legislation that you have to then read through and balance with so the case law. Um, lawyers, uh, legally illiterate. So. Well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to dismiss my profession. There's a lot of really, really good uh, lawyers and a lot of really good judges and a lot of sane, sober individuals who take the law very seriously. But it's becoming impossible to manage um, the competing cultures of an impartial legal system with a very overdetermined, polarized uh, political culture. Uh, and, and, and we have to wait and see. Maybe, it, like many things, there are these phases and societies move through different phases um, and we will actually start to maybe return to a, a common law tradition. But at the moment, um, I feel that uh, policy wonks run Britain and I don't even know who they are or what they want to achieve. But the presumption of freedom doesn't seem to be it. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Have we got some questions from the audience? Uh, Eric, has anybody got a microphone? Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, very passionate uh, comments, uh, uh, Professor. Um, oh, I'm Eric Hendricks, Dutch sociologist and a fellow at the Danube Institute since uh, two weeks ago. I'm very, very glad to be here. Um, uh, I have a very selfish question. Uh, because I wanted to ask you about uh, the continent, so I can I can clearly see you are uh, t terribly upset and rightfully upset about the state of law in your uh, native country of uh, Great Britain. Um, 
uh, where a common law tradition is being disrupted by a new human rights regime. And uh, one of my uh, grandparents is, is from Britain, but three of my grandparents are from the Netherlands, so I'm more welded to the, uh, to the continent. So I have to, my selfish question is, uh, what, what about the continent? What about the legal, we, we already, we never even had this common law tradition. So does it make our, let's say the Netherlands, is our situation not, not even worse than the situation in Britain? Yes, your common law tradition is dying, but we didn't even have that tradition. So, so when it comes to freedom of speech and the freedom of speech being, being um, under threat by this overdetermined political culture that uses these vaguely defined rights, these vaguely defined exceptions to those rights, uh, since that is more or less the starting point on the continent, how is Britain worse than, let's say, a country like the Netherlands or a country like Germany? Uh, because aren't we even worse off? And shouldn't I be? Should I not be even more upset than you are right now? It's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know how one would begin to make a comparative study of of free speech cultures. I know that there is. Um, you know, a, a general consensus amongst the network that I inhabit that, that freedom of expression is constantly, like so many fundamental freedoms, uh, they are considered inalienable and natural because we somehow intuitively know them. I think, for example, the idea that a parent would consider that they have no rights over their child it's, it's just a nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. The chil children are, uh, you know, have, have, have a relationship with the parent that is before it is legally defined, it is, it is, it is experienced. Uh, and I would say similarly with the right to freedom of expression, your right to speak your mind and to, and to share your concerns with your fellow man and woman over things that you share in common and that you want answers to, solutions to. It, it doesn't need to be legally defined, it's just understood. Um, so, so, so can you compare... Um, the situation in Britain today with its history of, you know, traditionally understood as, 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 a, as a reasonably lib liberal and uh, free society where in particular the press um, and, and, and rights such as the right to politically associate with other people and to speak in public and to have opinions. Um, can you compare that with a country like the Netherlands and say it is worse or better and why? I, I don't know if you can do that. Um, and, and how you would go about measuring these things. Um, and and the, one of the biggest problems that you raise correctly is that given the situation in the UK now is not the time for some sort of written constitution. That is a huge debate in my country. Um, and many of people who defend the, the idea of a written constitution as opposed to the unwritten customary arrangements that we have is that um, it makes the country less um, vulnerable uh, to these kinds of onslaughts um, that we see, for example, through the, through the political indoctrination of our public sector through these third sector organizations. Um, so there are lots of discussions about where we've come from, why we're here. Um, and as I showed you in the beginning of my talk, Dicey seemed to think in the late 19th century that actually the continent did suffer, particularly in relation to freedom of the press. And John re mentioned his colleague from the United States who said that he was surprised to find that even, you know, without a First Amendment, he was, he was quite impressed by the robust uh, critical culture of, of, of UK artistic um, expression and, you know, and, and, and general debate in public life. And I still believe that there is the remnants of that. One of the reasons why I think there's been such a pushback um, against political policing in the UK or, or, or the enforcement of a transgender political position is that people have a memory, cultural memory, that they should be able to say these things and that they have been able to say these things in the past. And they also have a civic tradition of political association. And what you see in the UK is that people mobilize very quickly, coalitions are formed and groups get together and they utilize public space to make statements and to, um, to make demands. And those demands get heard by, by politicians like Nicola Sturgeon who may well have to resign because she hasn't been listening to people who have now mobilized and made their position clear outside Holy Rood on the streets, in public, on TV, in front of cameras. And whether that tradition is as robust on the continent 
I, I don't think it is. Um, and that memory of being able to, you know, gather, form coalitions, make demands, speak freely, produce artworks. I, I think there is a cultural memory in the UK that, that we can still rely on that. Um, uh, but whether or not you have something equivalent in different continental countries that you can rely on, um, because you are suffering from the same problem that we are suffering, um, you know, that is for an expert from your own country to, 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 to offer. I, I really couldn't comment on that. But uh, at the moment, we're all kind of united, I think, on what we can all see happening, which is an authoritarianism, the like of which I'm afraid we have not seen uh, for some time, but we have seen before. Thank you. Thank you. I am Peter Molnar and a free speech scholar myself. I also spent some time at the Central European University. <laughs> Me too, <laughs> yes. Hi. It was nice to hear your passionate talk indeed. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, for a long time I have been focusing on so-called hate speech, but earlier I was looking at libel and I, w I would like to ask you, where would you place, so I, I, I don't know the very rec the re more recent developments, I have to confess, but, but I recall that, if I recall well, for example, in a Holocaust denier case, uh, David Irving put on trial Deborah Lipstadt, an American historian who called him on her in her book a Holocaust denier, and David Irving, for good reason, took her to court in Britain because Britain, at least that at a time about 20 years ago, was known as a libel haven, yes. a place where if someone if, if someone wanted to restrict the freedom of speech, including speech in the press of someone who was critical of a certain in another person, then it was a very good chance to win that case against the speaker or the newspaper. So, and as, as I recall, that was under the common law system. And, and up to the point while I was following this, I saw there was some hope that the common law system of the UK could work it out and make it more speech protective. So I just wonder how, if, if and, and sorry that it's a little bit out of the focus of your speech, but but it's an important part of it, yeah. of course, yeah. of, of the whole free speech system of a country. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, a common, it's a common issue that's raised that if we have, as England does, very strong libel laws that go back, those were the examples that Dicey gave when he was saying, you know, that there are strong punishments uh, for speech in England and no proclamation of a right to freedom of expression and the example that he gives are 19th century libel laws and blasphemy, anti-blasphemy laws. Um, and so the question often comes up, well, hang on a minute, isn't, isn't libel a kind of censorship of speech? And yes, it is. But libel is um, a very specific uh, measurable outcome where you have to show that the words that are used or published have a detriment, a measurable detriment, on the life of the person about whom those words were used. So you'd have to be able to show in a defamation trial uh, or a libel case that, you know, in, in today's world, you would have to show that somebody lost income, they lost social standing, uh, they lost the chance of uh, professional development or career pro uh, progression um, because of something that somebody said about them, uh, which is either not true or malicious. And, uh, you know, in that sense, you can see that there is a raison d'etre for uh, libel and defamation laws to protect individual reputations. Uh, but of course, it is a sanctional speech. But in that case that you mentioned, uh, Deborah Lipstadt's speech was protected. And his uh, defense that he's not a Holocaust denier failed, presumably because the court found it untrue. 
I don't know, I haven't read that judgment. But I mean, it's a very common question. How do you justify freedom of expression in a, uh, as, a, as a constitutional right at common law in a country which has such you know, stringent libel and defamation law? The, the answer is it is a bit of a contradiction, but defamation is about you know, restrictions placed on an individual to practice their life and their job because of something that someone has said which is not true and is published and known in the country as a whole, uh, I think I think freedom of expression and libel can sit side by side without too much uh, problem. Thank you for your question. I think well, we've got two, what, one question up here. And may I? Yeah. yeah. My name is Andras Hanak. I'm an attorney also. Um, I think it was fascinating. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I think we could continue this, most problems after this or some other time. Uh, I have two comments. Um, some more fortunate countries have constitutions, real constitutions, no matter whether they are written, but there is constitutional litigation, and these protected rights are enshrined in a constitution for better or worse. That's clearly the case in the United States, but in many other European countries, and constitutional litigation uh, enforces these human rights, freedom of speech, and uh, uh, religion and everything else. Uh, and uh, in contrast, uh, Britain has something, common law, which may be a bit of constitution or may not be a constitution. And I think I don't want to go through the, th th uh, this problem. But when you say that the convention, European convention, in each country in Europe, courts first enforce their constitution. Their Freedom of speech arguments go under the Constitution, German, French, or whatever Constitution, and then comes, as a last resort, the Convention. So, um, I, I, again, I think that what, and, and finally, when you say that, um, you know, the exception under common law, that unless it's a breach of law, unless it's not protected by law, that's a fairly loose sort of definition uh, for someone um, who is, uh, uh, basically used to constitutional litigation. And when your last statement about defamation is about statements of facts, and if you express a statement and a fact that is incorrect and that causes harm, it's a per se defamation under common law. And I was just wondering if you wanted to discuss the Defamation Act, which is a fairly different subject, the UK Defamation Act. Um, uh, of, I think, 2014 or so. But anyway, I enjoyed this, and, and I 2013, think 2013, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that is another, another issue, that we now sure, rely, yeah. we rely on legislation. We don't really rely on common law. I mean, there is some influence so of again, common law. So again, my point definitely. is, if you have yeah. a good constitution and a litigation and it's enforced, then other legislation could be constrained by, um, uh, you know, courts and other methods. Yes, I mean, that is a huge um, conversation to have. I, I think the, the point I really wanted to make was that if you have the um, replacement of a presumption of right to speech <clears throat> with a threshold of uh, religious or protected philosophical belief as the default definition of what is legitimate speech, uh, you are creating, I suppose, a, 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 a cultural legal transformation through that switch yeah and that and that for me was was yeah and i don't know maybe yeah as i said to the other gentleman maybe a written constitution can deal with some of this fallout um i'm, I'm not a fan of written constitutions actually uh, but i think we may be in need of something and it's probably going to have to be written down <laughs> but yeah we've got time uh. well let's not exaggerate uh, <laughs> Hello. Hello. I very much enjoyed your presentation. My name is Shandor Kerekes, and I am really wondering how you made it here. Your views are so liberal that uh, they are a little bit out of here, a little bit uh, besides the usual customary views of this place. However, I would like to address the five criteria that you listed there, amongst them blasphemy, for instance and um, other, yes, they are arbitrary, that's right. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is that they are so flimsy. 
they don't stand up to logic, no. then do, they don't stand up to uh, the test of uh, clear thinking. Absolutely. And it's a wonder that uh, nice educated people like lawyers often are, don't notice this. They tolerate this. Judges, how come, how come? Just to give you two examples, like, like blasphemy, right? There is nobody to cause harm to, or at least nobody came for, forward to complain about that. As, as far as blasphemy is concerned, it's a harmless and victimless crime. It should, should have been outlawed long, long time ago. I, I don't hear the word you're saying, sorry. The, what, what is a victimless crime? Blasphemy. 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 Apologies, I couldn't hear. Thank I, you. I, I thought you, you would... <laughs> I'm sorry. And the other is uh, uh, Islamophobia. Well, what is a phobia really other than an irrational fear of something? But being fearful of Islam, especially radical Islam, there is nothing irrational about that. So... Uh, Islamophobia as a word, a fo an idea, and as a term should have been long wiped from the public discourse. Well, I mean, you know, if you're, no if, you're looking at, if you're looking at common law rationality, you, you know it's rubbish, this concept of Islamophobia, because we don't have equivalent. I mean, you have anti-Semitism, but that's not technically about the religion of Judaism. We don't have anything like Christophobia, which would refer to a phobia of Christianity, but it's quite common to hear people in the UK talk very disparagingly about practicing Christians and their views and their beliefs, uh, particularly on certain issues. Uh, whereas that same, that same right to criticize somebody for their Muslim views, well, the liberal press anyway would shy away from that. But I mean, you know from that simple fact that we don't have a concept of Christophobia, uh, or Christophobia, or whatever you want to call it, that, that this concept of Islamophobia is, is, is arbitrary and it is a political whim. It's been introduced by various think tanks, probably on the left side of politics, um, and those policies have now come to shape our understanding of you know, hate crime and what is offensive speech and what is not. It has nothing to do with the common law. It has nothing to do with the law. Oh, was it? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, one, last uh, one last question. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm just an A-level student from London. Um, I'm wondering if freedom of speech was better protected than it is today, how would you account for the fact that institutions have, have a right to have an ideology as well? So, for example, I'm sure no one in this room would think it's unfair if the Conservative Party dismissed a member who said that social, who tweeted that socialism is the only way. How is that dissimilar, is what I'm asking, to institutions like, for example, the NHS, who may dismiss someone who's uh, expressed concerns about um, the COVID narrative that's being, that was um, spun. Um, how would, how would you, how is that different, is what I'm asking you. Um, does that, do, do institutions not have a right to have their own ideology and dismiss people who don't um, fit that ideology? It's a very good question. Um, do institutions have a right <laughs> to an ideology? Um, well, let, let, let's forget the NHS for a moment and think about the judiciary. If, if, do you, th can you see the problem, for example, if, if the judiciary have an ideology? <clears throat> That's an open question back to you. The judiciary meaning the judges who decide cases. Yeah, so, so if, if we see a problem with, with, with certain public institutions that are set up to serve the entire population, um, not selective members of the population, um, but to actually, as far as they can, to serve the public impartially. 
that would go not only for the judges, but for uh, p the police um, or uh, the civil service. Uh, indeed, you mentioned the Conservative Party. Well, if you're elected a Conservative MP, but you only allowed Conservative voters to come and visit you when you were elected in your constituency, and you said, I don't want to deal with non-conservative voters because I'm a conservative MP. You would be thrown out, but not because you had um, the wrong ideology, but because you weren't serving your constituents equally, irrespective of your constituents' ideology. So the ideal really is that, especially in public life and in institutions which are supported by taxpayers' money, and are supposed to reflect and represent the interests of the entire population, where you have very partisan views promoted, uh, that's going to lead to huge resentment. And I know this sounds cynical, but there should be at least a performance of impartiality. There should be at least a respect for the idea that everybody is equal before the law. And so, when we see, for example, public institutions saying that we promote, um, we, are, we are encouraging people to apply for this or that job from an ethnic minority background, what that's saying is that don't apply if you have this skin color, because you ain't gonna get that job. So that's going to create a sense that these institutions are selectively representing some groups of people over others. And it, particularly if you live in a climate where you cannot question that and say, hang on a minute, that, that feels unfair because then you're called a Nazi, right? That is a recipe for social division and real demoralization. And so what I'm saying is, I, I get your question, the, of course, you're never going to live in a perfect world and people will be um, dismissed from their jobs for all sorts of reasons. And believe me, some of my clients who I defend on free speech grounds, I think are total idiots. And I say to them, what the hell did you tweet that for? How much bloody vodka had you been drinking? It's a really bad combination, social media and alcohol. Don't do it. You know, that's not really a pro-free speech argument, but it's a pragmatic one, okay? So I get it, I, I get that we don't live in a perfect world, but what we have to do as a society are, is two things. We have to fight to try and maintain a standard of impartiality in public life, and we have to support um, the rights of people, citizens, taxpayers, to participate in debates about difficult issues. And we cannot simply say, no, this is not a debate, you're a Nazi, shut up. Because if you do that, you are going to produce the phenomenon that you say you're opposed to. You're going to produce people who say, well, what the hell? Let's take over the government with guns. Let's shoot black people. Let's kill gay people. Let's have camps for the, for the ones that we're trying to liberate our country from. You will have that totalitarian response if you keep crushing people, and the only way we can hope to avoid what I think is a totalitarian nightmare from the right and from the left is to fight for at least um, perhaps a hopelessly outdated ideal of impartiality in public life, but we must also protect the right to have difficult conversations in public life. And that means treating people generously and not acting in bad faith and constructing them as, as, as malevolent actors when it's patently obvious that they are trying to participate in a national conversation. And the example I would give is when an elderly person in their 80s says, colored people, which was my grandfather's generation and that is what British people said, instead of persons of color. And you can make that mistake in good faith because you're elderly and you're trying to express yourself and you can be utterly disparaged for your stupid, racist, outdated views. That is not a generous way to live and it is not respectful to people who put their lives on the line to protect 
our country from uh, you know, a marauding army that was premised on entirely the totalitarian principle. So you know, that's just an example of how people are acting in very dishonest and, and disingenuous ways in public life. And all we need, I think, to restore the balance is to try and be impartial and to try and encourage discussion and not jump to the most ludicrous accusations of Nazism every time someone says something that departs slightly from the political fashion of the moment. Uh, thank you very much. I am a student from Utrecht Lutheran University. I'm currently studying a BA of International Relations. I want to thank you so much for the wonderful and insightful speech about the legal systems of the UK. And something that I wanted to ask about is how you... You say, said that the Equality Act had been inspired by the uh, Europe, yeah, European Union, Union's uh, constitution, so it's this, and, and how, how was the section, and was based from their uh, anti-discriminatory sections as well. So well, because the European Union in general has a civil law a system, and, and how that is beginning to influence uh, the UK's common law system, do you think that in the long term, because majority of the world has a civil law system, um, do you think that is eventually going to end up influencing the other, the common law systems? Because, because uh, and having a simple and common common uh, law system would be beneficial, well, in some some ways more than the other. And what I thought of from my studies was the Brussels effect and how the European Union, in, in this way, is also still affecting the UK. A, through this uh, legal precedent it set? I mean, the, the, the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, has, has traditionally been quite respectful of the decisions of the UK higher courts, the House of Lords. Uh, very rarely do they go against um, a final decision made by the House of Lords. Um, and I think that pays... that that that. Um, pays service, lip service, to the idea of the English common law as a global commodity. Um, we do have in the world, you said that the majority of countries are civil law systems, but English common law has been exported worldwide uh, and is used today, particularly in arbitrations between countries. Um, and the judges who specialize in international arbitration are, are, are predominantly English judges. And they're very desired on the international stage Primarily because they're considered not to be corrupt, they can't be bought, but also because the system of precedent um, is, is a very satisfying one for all sorts of reasons. It's, it, it may sound clumsy and cumbersome because it's not tidy, uh, but it's actually, having worked uh, in, 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 in law and seeing how it actually, how cases shape and influence other cases, there is something almost organically simple about it, where you don't really need lots and lots and lots of descriptors. You can just find analogous facts in a similar case and extrapolate principles on the basis of those facts. And what I really like about common law is that it's not oriented towards victory and losing, but rather a kind of um, compromise that as to the best, at least in the civil system, obviously I'm speaking not about criminal law, but to the best um, of, uh, of the judge's ability, he or she will try to uh, find what's best for both parties. So I think that common law, it, it can be presented as a very messy, outdated, archaic, a crazy system of, um, you know, as I described it at the beginning, there's a vast archive of, of, of thousands of cases. But actually, once you see how people operate through the common law system in terms of identifying relevant cases, um, it is astonishingly simple sometimes um, how it works. And when you look at the sort of, I mean, I studied codification of European law for my PhD. And I remember, uh, you know, reading about the codification of German law, the Gesetzbuch of, you know, um, the late 18th century. And it and this Napoleonic project that then followed with the Na Napoleonic Code. And this ludicrous, if you don't mind me saying, assumption that everything could be written down in advance, that all problems could be 
pre-imagined, and then all solutions could be written down. And, you know, Napoleon told his jurists, if you want to know what to do, you go to the code. The idea that you would go anywhere else was, you know, basically verboten. And so people had these huge expectations that the code would contain the truth of what to do and what to think and what de decision to come to. But we know from the common law tradition that it, that is the most impractical thing because what you need then is a code the size of the globe to contain every possible outcome in every possible imaginable scenario, which is what they tried to do in 18th century unifying Germany. The common law, although it, it is this vast archive of cases, basically says you just go where common sense takes you. You go to the cases that speak the most to this particular set of facts. You don't need to write it all down in a huge book and then enforce it with the power of a police state. Now, I may be, I may be slightly generalizing the uh, historical European codification experience, but my defense of common law actually is in its pragmatism and the simplicity and its organic um, common sense built in, uh, which I think should, in some ways, uh, influence the rest of the world and has done for the good and uh, yeah I don't know if it has a future I know I ended on a pessimistic note it is possible that it will disappear like the panda but um hey pandas still exist <laughs> and I think they have babies now sometimes even in zoos <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very, very sorry about the slides. I, I, I wish that they had been in place for you to read the quotes. But anyway, thank you for coming and thank you for your great question. Thank you.